So I'm actually amazed that we have such a great turnout for a talk entitled Stereo Photogrammetry Capturing Real World Environments for Experiential VR, considering that it's beer o'clock and the pub has already opened. So I'm going to try and uh, get, get through how we built Mount Everest uh, in CGI uh, in about 15, 15 minutes or so, and then we can get my, uh, my uh, friend Holly, who also is called Thor, uh, for also from Iceland, to round this up uh, with probably a better talk than mine. Uh, so, uh, just quickly about us, uh, we're a startup based in Iceland, as Will noted, uh, formed by three ex-CCP games guys. Uh, our claim to fame back in the day was uh, we creating, created the sci-fi MMO EVE Online. And uh, these days we're back into the deep end of the pool doing pure VR games and experiences. Uh, we've got a team of 13 in Iceland and we work also collaboratively with other companies around the world to create what we hope is, uh, is outstanding VR uh, for the masses. Um, so Everest VR is our first project and it's the subject of my talk today. Uh, this is a project that we released on uh, HTC Vive uh, back in August of last year. We've been updating it as we go along um, and uh, we're about to actually launch on Oculus with touch support uh, imminently so that's what we've been showing today uh, for the first time. And, uh, and to give you a little bit about the kind of uh, founding idea of Everest VR, uh, a very good friend of ours, a guy called Dade Einarsson, is an animation director and VFX supervisor who owns a studio in Iceland called RVX. He used to be the head of animation for Framestore here in the UK. And uh, when we were starting up Everest, we were thinking about all of our 20 different great ideas for our first game. And we walked into his studio and we saw, uh, if we could cue the video please, uh, we saw a model of Mount Everest that they had created entirely synthetically uh, for use in the Universal film, use the Universal working title film Everest that came out a couple of years ago. So what they had created was an incredibly accurate model of Mount Everest, accurate down to a 50 meter resolution uh, that they were using basically to create synthetic shots uh, where they had to create helicopter shots, for example, where helicopters couldn't physically fly. So they set out and, and created the most detailed, accurate model of Mount Everest ever created to date. And we started thinking, you know, what if we did a technical test and we could just figure out how to make this actually run in real time in Unreal Engine? We might be onto a really interesting concept as our first project. So we set out to do our technical test and, and to figure out how we could actually do this. And what I'm about to talk about today is really kind of the pipeline, how we actually originally created the model and recomputed it for VR in real time with the RVX guys, and then a few of the other things that we had to do to actually make the whole thing fly at 90 frames a second. Uh, these are actually real time shots. Uh, from Unreal Engine, so this is not pre-rendered. Uh, it's stuttering a little bit in the video playback, but it's a very smooth 90 hertz experience in VR. And you can see that the visual quality is something that is very, very close to photoreal quality. And the reason that's important is when you're creating a real world environment, your option is basically in VR twofold. You can either uh, do a 360 video, and I'm gonna date myself horribly here when I say it just feels to me like QuickTime VR. Uh, 360 video gives you no sense of player agency, there's no interaction, there's no sense of motion, no positioning, and ultimately I personally believe it's a novelty. It'll be great for chief site acquisition and show you visually what something looks like, but if you actually want to really experience it, your only option is a synthetic environment like Everest created an engine like Unreal or Unity. So how do we actually build this mountain? First off, you all know the constraints, right? Minspec, 970, AMD, uh, you know, these are good GPUs, but still you have to optimize heavily to get something like Everest to run. 90 frames a second at one and a half HD resolution and you're running at 140% over to our screen percentage, so your super sampling is high. So with RVX, we basically used the pipeline that they used for the Hollywood film. They used a process called stereo photogrammetry, which very simply is taking a database of regular photographs of a real world environment, usually shot shooting the same spot from two different vantage points. And the more photos, the merrier. We accumulated a database of about 30,000 images for the Everest project. Uh, and then you use basically a software tool that takes those photographs and begins to infer the X, Y, Z coordinates of the underlying space by using the comparison between the photographs. And this gives you basically something called a point cloud. Uh, it uses some, a crazy supercomputer uh, and you end up with something that actually could look like a real world environment. This is Dade Anderson at Basecamp uh, a few years ago when they were on site doing principal photography for Everest. And he did um, you know, something really amazing with the film. I mean, some of the shots, uh, if you've seen the film, look exactly like this. These are real images of Everest. These are the Kungu Icefalls. And you can see that 
doing this as a manual modeling and, and sort of texturing process is pretty hard. And so the only way to do this accurately, because the mountain had to be accurate in a real physical setting for the film, was actually to use stereo photogrammetry to create it. And so we play video two. This is what site acquisition for a Hollywood film looks like. So this is Dade Enosot hanging out of a helicopter, flying from the western Kuhn down the Kundu Icefall. He's literally leaning out of the helicopter with a HDR camera, shooting fast photos along the way, capturing basically everything along the flight path. He did this multiple times uh, with uh, a team of Indian military helicopter pilots. That's crazy shit. I'm never going to do that myself. But the fact that we had access to this type of capture uh, project was the enabler for the entire project. We would not have created Everest for less than three or four million dollars if we hadn't had this actual asset to work with. Uh, so you can kind of get a sense of the environment. And you saw the real-time rendering earlier, so you can see we were getting pretty close uh, to what the actual real environment looks like. So we go on to the next uh, slide, please. Uh, we worked actually with a bespoke, uh, very specialist company called Designing Reality, also based in Iceland, uh, who had come up with a stereo photogrammetry pipeline that uh, consisted of basically a supercomputer. Uh, so this is the spec for the system that was used to take the photographs and create the point cloud. 28 cores, 128 gig of RAM, six GeForce Titans in an SLI configuration. If you geek out on tech, that's pretty crazy. Uh, and a bunch of fast uh, uh, hard drive memory. 30,000 pictures went in. Uh, we ended up with 105 gigapixels uh, in the actual point cloud. So this took months of compute time. Uh, and we ended up with, in the mesh version with about 1.5 trillion polygons. So how do we get from that point to running in real time? Well, we ended up by breaking the model apart. So we ended up with 126 patches. Uh, each, of, each was about 15 million polygons. We've reduced that all down to about 24 million polygons. And I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, we baked normal maps, maps at a lower le level of detail, and then we had to do some cleanup, obviously, and obviously model close-up scenes that were different from the actual mountain model. But this is what uh, kind of the very high resolution model looks like. You can see that there's no chance in hell that this is going to render in real time. Uh, you can see the density, actually, of the mesh that, that we ended up with, and this would never run. Uh, even on a supercomputer in real time. Uh, so we use SimpliCon. Uh, they're a phenomenal middleware company that basically allowed us to generate level of detail models from the mountain. So we, each patch was going from a triangle count of about 132,000 down to a lowest LOD of about 7,000, uh, which allowed us to basically make this all function in real time. And you can see the polygon decimation process that they enable, which is pretty cool getting us to this like, very low level of detail so we could actually balance everything out and make a render in real time. Uh, we built everything in Unreal Engine. Uh, that's our engine of choice. We love it because the renderer is awesome and Blueprint is the only way to create VR games if you're on a budget and you don't want an army of programmers. Um, so we basically use their mega terrain uh, system to basically create the overall Himalaya backdrop. So we have a lot of low resolution imagery and model sets far away, but in the middle we had the high density uh, stereo photogrammetry capture uh, from uh, RVX. And then we basically, you're seeing here a closer up view where we have the patches and how we broke up the actual model set. Another shot from that. Uh, and uh, in the basic Unreal structure, again, we were doing manual culling here, so occlusion culling and so on from 126 patches. The problem was we had 8K textures in every patch. The texture data was 24 gigabytes. That's not going to run in real time or even on any computer. Uh, so we had to actually get to a better texture resolution. Now, how are we going to make that happen? Well, fortunately, these guys in Belgium called Graphene make this cool tool called Granite, uh, which basically is a texture compression and streaming uh, solution that does pretty amazing stuff. Uh, it basically took each of our uh, texture patches from 8 gigs down to 1 gig and allowed us to stream that from disk in real time. So that's what you're actually seeing when you're trying out Everest in real time. It's streaming all off disk. And again, they use a tile solution. So basically, it breaks up the, the model set into something that then can be ordered into memory and sort of compressed in the, in the kind of images you're seeing here. And since I'm the business guy, I can't really explain this image to you, so I'll just press on. Uh, we, in our lighting, uh, which was, of course, critical uh, to make this model really come alive and feel like it was actually dynamic, uh, we, we had a pretty interesting challenge. Actually, do, doing snow in real time is pretty tough. So we had to make heavy use of Fresnel, uh, both on the diffuse and specularity, um, and basically approximate subsurface scattering and interreflections of snow and ice 
and we had to do a skylight for indirect specular lighting. So that's key because of the indirect light bounce of snow. So this was all kind of very hard. We had a great creative director and he knows how to do snow because he lives in Iceland and he has to look out the window for inspiration for how lighting and snow conditions work. Uh, this is an image from the finished uh, project. So this is the Hillary step to just give you a sense of what it looks like. Um, and you know, basically here, you're seeing here some of the underlying map, normal maps and, and the sort of under the hood look of the composition in Unreal. This is what you do in Unreal Engine to run at 90 hertz in VR. You basically turn almost everything off. So if you're an engine uh, or a game developer, you're probably familiar with this by now. Uh, you basically shut off a lot of the stuff that makes uh, the Unreal Render amazing for console or PC games. Fortunately, what Epic have now done with their new forward renderer is bringing back a lot of functionality like anti-aliasing that really is going to count for visual quality going forward. But I'm not going to dwell too much on this. And let's look at the final product. This is a mixed reality trailer that uh, we created. Uh, we kind of built our own bespoke mixed reality capture system in Unreal. And it just gives you kind of a snapshot of actual people experiencing Mount Everest for the first time. On that note, I'll conclude the presentation and take some questions if you have any. And uh, you can also send me some questions off offline to Thor at soulfire.com. Any questions as follow? That's a tile render for rendering that geometry. It looked like it was doing continuous level of detail across the whole surface. Is that, is that right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we're doing, we're doing uh, basically, we're doing real time switching of LODs. And um, it's, not, it's not real time tessellation, okay. if that makes sense. Uh, we, we chose not to go down that path. But we're doing very fast switching of LOD levels across the different patches, basically. 